Well, got your Bibles. Revelation 14. We are going to walk through this chapter together as we're considering this theme that Jesus is full of mercy and justice. And we've been seeing that lay out clearly as we've been walking through these chapters this fall. You know, often I've heard it said that the book of Revelation doesn't have to be a difficult book to understand if you follow and recognize that within the book, there does come this what's called a divine outline. In chapter one of the book, chapter one, verse 19, John is told to write the things that he's seen, the things which are, and the things which will take place after this. Well, that slide's not quite ready yet, guys in the back. Um, the things that we've seen, the things which are, and the things that will take place after this. That's kind of how the book unfolds. And if you've been walking through this book with us, you'll remember that chapter 1, John writes the things that he's seeing. And what he's seeing is Jesus. Jesus revealed, resurrected, enthroned, and in glory. He's on a throne it's powerful. He, he has all authority. That which he claimed as he ascended into heaven, that all authority had been given to him in heaven and on earth. We see that visually in chapter one. And then in chapters two and three, the things that which are at the time that John was writing, the things that are in our time, the time of the church, that's chapters two and three. And then the things that are to come, kind of the program of God for all that is yet to come is chapter four through the end of the book. And in chapter six through 19, the season, the age of which we're looking out of time is known as the great tribulation, the great tribulation that God institutes to wake up the nation of Israel and to shake up those who are far from him. And that's what we see, chapter 6, all the way through chapter 19. It's this time where God's judgment comes to fruition. And this isn't something new. I mean, if you've walked through the Old and New Testament, you know that God always deals with sin. And for those of us who have faith in Christ, the sin, the judgment, the punishment for our sin is taken care of because of the cross of Jesus. How many of you guys are thankful for that on a Sunday morning? <clears throat> that the judgment of God is satisfied on our behalf because Jesus hung on a cross and rose from the dead. And yet there are still those who, who reject that goodness and grace and gift of God through salvation. This, this world is still riddled with sin. And as a faithful God, he's faithful in his love and he's faithful in his mercy and he's faithful in his justice. And chapter 14, this is going to blow your mind. Chapter 14 comes after chapter 13. Isn't that amazing? Now that's important for today. You say, why? Well, in chapter 13, the beast, as he's described and known here in the book of Revelation, is ferociously victorious, it seems, against all that oppose him. I mean, you're in Revelation 14, but look back at chapter 13, verse 3, where it says, the whole world, the whole world, gave allegiance to the beast. They worshiped the dragon, it says in verse four, for giving the beast such power, and they also worshiped the beast. Who is as great as the beast, they exclaimed. Who is able to fight against him? Look at verse seven. And the beast was allowed to wage war against God's holy people and to conquer them. He was given authority to rule over every tribe, every people, every language, every nation. Can you imagine watching a movie and that's how it ends and the whole world was worshiping Satan and the credits rise? Like that's how chapter 13 ends. It's dark, it's bleak. 
In chapter 14, where we are today, John, the author, it's like he's taken in a vision to the very end of the tribulation, right before the millennium, and John is given a vision of Jesus who's identified as the Lamb, showing us that the beast, the dragon, the Antichrist is not the ultimate victor Jesus is. See, chapter 14 comes after chapter 13. I love what Pastor Skip Heisek says of this. He says, Revelation chapter 14 is like a breath of fresh air. After the horrors that are described in the preceding chapters and before the terrors that follow it, Jesus sees a vision of the Lamb of God enjoying the company of his redeemed people. And here we learn that the Lord's grace and mercy do not in any way conflict with his holiness and judgment. That's why I wanted to put this up on the screen. I want to read that again. Here we learn that the Lord's grace and mercy do not in any way conflict with his holiness and judgment. And we remember that the time for getting right with God is now. This is what chapter 14 shows us this morning. We're going to see God's mercy, his grace in perfect harmony with his holiness and his judgment. You see, in chapter 12, chapter 13, things are dark. It's like we just read in chapter 13. It's like the beast is just given this authority to conquer. People are worshiping him. So in chapter 14... As John is writing this to those Christians in that first century, he's given these assurances, these sureties to remind the people of God about. And so here's how we're going to break this chapter down this morning. Three different things we'll see this morning in the midst of the attacks that God's people are undergoing. In verses 1 through 5, we're going to see the surety of God's salvation, that God can and will save. It's a sure thing. You can take it to the bank. The surety of God's salvation in verses 1 through 5. Then in verses 6 through 13, we will see the surety of the gospel of God being proclaimed even in the midst of this dark time that is to come. It's a surety of God's salvation, a surety of the power of the gospel. And then the last part of this chapter, verses 14 through 20, here's what we'll see. It's what we've been seeing throughout this season together. The surety that God's judgment is coming. Salvation, the gospel, and judgment. Look at verse 1 as we consider this theme of salvation. If you're there, let me know by saying Jesus is full of mercy and justice. Jesus is full of mercy and justice. That was long to say, wasn't it? Well, let's look at verse 1. Then I saw the Lamb standing on Mount Zion, and with him were 144,000 who had his name and his father's name written on their foreheads. And I heard a sound from heaven like the roar of a mighty ocean waves or the rolling of loud thunder. It was like the sound of many harpists playing together. It's a powerful noise, but a beautiful noise. This great choir sang a wonderful new song in front of the throne of God. And before the four living beings and the 24 elders, going back to what we see at the early part of this book, no one could learn this song except the 144,000 who had been redeemed from the earth. You see, they had kept themselves as pure as virgins, following the lamb wherever he goes. They've been purchased from among the people on the earth as a special offering to God and to the lamb. They have told no lies. They are without blame. In the midst of all that's happening, John is given a vision. And here's what he sees. The Lamb of God, Jesus, standing on Mount Zion. The 144,000 that we heard of in Revelation 7, they're with him. And these 144,000, they have the name of the Lamb, Jesus, and the Father written upon their foreheads. And John hears something. This thunderous sound from heaven. 
this, this great choir singing a brand new song before the throne. Those four living beings that are referenced earlier in the book of Revelation, the 24 elders are all there. And this song, it's interesting. This song is known solely by these 144,000 who are called the redeemed ones. And we're given at least five descriptions of who these people are. That they're ones that kept themselves pure. That they followed the lamb wherever he went. That they were purchased, redeemed from among the people of the earth for a special offering, a special service. They told no lies. They're without blame. So let me see if I can ask and maybe even answer to the best of my ability a couple of questions to better understand what's going on here. A lot is said of these 144,000. So my, my first question kind of centers around them. Who, who are they? Well, what's the significance of them being in this portion of the book at this time? And what does all this mean? I mean, we first saw this 144,000 back in Revelation chapter 7. And we were told that there were 12,000 Jews from each of the 12 tribes of Israel that were selected. And they were sealed, meaning they were given this like divine protection from the attacks of the enemy and any of the judgments that God was pouring out upon the earth. And this description that we're given is insightful. They're sealed. Remember chapter 13 that there was a different kind of description on the foreheads of people? Six, six, six. Well, this seal, this protection that they have on their foreheads predates what happens in Revelation 13. Their walk and their talk were one, we see from this chapter, and they're preaching a message of repentance and they're living lives of purity. Well, what does all this mean? I like what one author says regarding what John sees here. He says, John sees the lamb, Jesus, standing with 144,000, sealed with his name, and the name of his father on their foreheads. And where are they? On Mount Zion. Now, this author says that commentators, teachers, pastors, they kind of part ways like the Red Sea as to what this means. Is this Mount Zion literally on earth? Is this a picture in heaven? I mean, Psalm 48 references Jerusalem, the city of the Lord, as it's also called Mount Zion. In Hebrews 12, there's a reference made to an heavenly Jerusalem, a heavenly Mount Zion. So the question is, well, where is this Mount Zion? Is this something that's referred to on earth or in heaven? Some see it this way, some see it that way, where the redeemed are standing before the Father in heaven. See, here's the dynamic. Whichever it is, here's the point. The enemy is not victorious, the Lamb is. See, as believers, and especially as you read through the book of Revelation, if you were just to leave off your reading in chapter 13, you would think that this is a Star Wars dynamic playing out in the book of the Bible, that there's light and there's dark, and you never know who's coming up on the scene to win. Is Kylo Ren? Is this, who's going to win? See, God is not a created being. The enemy is. God isn't wondering and hoping that the enemy's plans won't thwart his ultimate plan. Ultimately, all that the enemy does plays right into the hand of the Father. Amen. The enemy is not victorious. The Lamb is. You know, it may be true that we're not at the end of the world, but we're living in a time where, the, where we're living in a world that's very, very near the end. We're not living necessarily in this, what we see in Revelation 13, but we are living in a world very near the end, a time where evil is called good and good is called evil. Now, if you look at 2 Timothy 3, we'll put that up on the screen. I think this describes beautifully, perfectly, the world that we live in today. Paul says this to Timothy, you should know that in the last days there will be very difficult times. People will love only themselves and their money. 
They will be boastful and proud, scoffing at God, disobedient to parents, ungrateful. They will consider nothing sacred. They'll be unloving and forgiving. They'll slander others, have no self-control. They'll be cruel and hate what is good. They'll betray friends, be reckless, puffed up with pride, love pleasure rather than God. They'll act religious, but reject the power that could make them godly. Stay away from people like that. I don't know if you would agree, but I see that perfectly describing the world in which we live in now. We're living in a time where the world is very near the end. But here, chapter 13, it's so much darker than the days that we are in now. It's horrific. The whole world is worshiping Satan. The beast is given authority and power to speak blasphemy against God and put to death any that oppose him. That's the context in which John has this vision that he sees Jesus on Mount Zion, a place of victory, a place that belongs to God with his 144,000 who are sealed. David Guzik says this. I thought it was helpful. He said, it's fair to ask, is the beast completely victorious over all of God's people? The presence of the 144,000 on Mount Zion with the lamb emphatically says no. Let me ask you a question. Do you ever wake up some days and go, gosh, am I going to make it through this? It seems like everything around me is encroaching upon me. Sometimes you need to see a vision of who Jesus is in his resurrected power and authority. And that's what John is doing here in Revelation 14. See, in this time during the tribulation, it's like the enemy is throwing with full force all that he has against Christians and the world is just loving it. Have you ever felt that you're in this place that, man, it seems like every time I try to take a step with the Lord, the enemy just keeps bringing me back? Well, here's what this chapter shows us. The salvation of God is a surety, something you can sink your teeth into and take to the bank. The lamb is victorious. This is who God is. This is where our confidence can be and remain, that salvation belongs to our God. Isaiah 59, 1. Listen to what the author writes. Listen, the Lord's arm is not too weak to save you, nor is his ear too deaf to hear you call. Jeremiah the prophet, living in dark days, he'd call out to God's people. In Jeremiah chapter 32, he said, O sovereign Lord, you made the heavens and the earth by your strong hand and powerful arm. Nothing is too hard for you. The salvation of God is a surety. You can bank on it. See, these 144,000s didn't have their eyes on what was around them, but who was above them. And so their lives, what did they look like? Well, they kept themselves pure. They followed the lamb wherever he went. They recognized that they were the ones that were redeemed. They, they didn't let lies not be a part of their speech. They're without blame. And I love the kind of relationship they have with God. Look again at verse 3 about this dynamic here in Revelation 14. It says, This great choir sang a wonderful new song in front of the throne and before the four living beasts and the 24 elders. And look at this part. No one could learn this song except for the 144,000 who had been redeemed. There is an intimacy that comes in walking with God in purity in the midst of difficulty. Anyone ever heard of Charles Spurgeon once or twice? Listen to something he says about this kind of dynamic. To be wrapped in praise to God is the highest state of the soul. When you bow in adoration, you're at your very highest. See, in Revelation 13, the beast is seeking everyone to worship him. In Revelation 14, in the midst of trial, in the midst of tragedy, in the midst of death, in the midst of persecution, 
You see these 144,000 who are walking with Jesus who find what they're created for, worship of God. And there's an intimacy there. They're the only ones that know the meanings of this word, the meaning of this song. And as the prince of preachers would say, to be wrapped in praise to God is the highest state of the soul. You're not going to find it in a place where you're finally free from difficulty. I don't know if anyone ever even found that place. We're like, well, I have no more worries. Everything's good. But isn't that the temptation? Well, if the dust could just settle, if this relationship could just be more better reconciled, if this dynamic could just come into play, oh, my, my soul would be satisfied. No. Your soul is satisfied in worship of your creator. That's where that intimacy is. That's what you're created for. That's what your heart beats for, to be in right relationship with God, no matter what is going on around you. And to be encouraged of this surety, the salvation of God is a sure thing. You can take it to the bank. And these individuals to whom John is writing, they themselves were going through an intense time of persecution from the Romans. Those that will go through this very thing that John writes about here in Revelation, these 144,000, they're picturesque. They're an example. They emphatically show us that God's salvation is a sure thing. A sure thing. So in our time, in our lives, in our walk with God, I want to encourage you, don't lose sight of the big picture. That's what chapter 14 is. You, you see the enemy attacking and John showing, no, listen, let me show you the big picture of what's happening. God's salvation is coming. Walk with him. Stay with him. Stick with him. For God is truly mighty to save, and he will. Don't you wish that you knew the timing of things from God? Don't you think Job wanted to know that? But see, we only know what's right in front of us. I'm so thankful there's one who's above us who knows all things. And we can trust in him and his salvation, for it's a sure thing. Now, John, as he's continued to give this vision, he's given this amazing insight as to what happens. Look at verse 6. He, he says, I saw another angel flying through the sky, carrying the eternal good news to proclaim to the people who belong to this world, to every nation, tribe, language, and people. Fear God, he shouted. Give glory to him. For the time has come when he will sit and judge. Worship him who made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and all the springs of water. Now, imagine with me, if you can, the temperature of the culture at this time. Everyone that's there is fearful and under the thumb of the beast. He, he's ruling, he's reigning, he's in authority. There's no other authority that can rise against him. So what does God do? He sends an angel, an angel, not commonplace for us in this time, but at this time in Revelation, God seemingly uses angels more and more visibly to frequently carry out his will. And God sends an angel to declare, fear God. Give glory to him, for the time is coming that he will judge. You know, one author says this, Today, the church is responsible for the proclamation of the gospel, but that will change after the rapture. Jesus said, And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations, and then the end will come. Because the church will be in heaven, God will use these 144,000 Jews, the two witnesses, and even an angel to spread his message. He will go to great lengths to give the world one last chance to be saved. Get the temperature of the culture. Everyone is under the thumb of the beast except for God. And he sends an angel to declare this message. Fear God. Fear God. 
See, everyone is afraid of the beast at this time. But to fear God, have a holy respect for him. Believe and know that he exists, that he is creator, that he will be the judge, not the enemy. See, here's the one's opinion that you need to live for. It's not anyone else other than God. He is the ultimate judge. And then another angel follows. Look at verse 8. Following, through, following him through the sky, shouting, Babylon is fallen. That great city is fallen because she made all the nations of the world drink the wine of her passionate immorality. Now, as we make our way through this book of Revelation, we're going to learn a little bit more about Babylon, specifically in chapter 18. But there's a lot of history related to Babylon. In the Old Testament, Babylon was the name of the city and an empire that was a world center for idol worship. The Babylonians took God's people into captivity. And throughout the book of Revelation, Babylon ultimately is this civilization, this culture, this lifestyle that's under the seduction of the enemy, captivating the hearts of the people, where, where their worship is towards him, the Antichrist. Commercialism and money, sexual immorality. In Revelation, there is this place that is both religious and commercial known as Babylon. And it's a center of power and prestige. Verse 8 says it's called that great city. And the second angel comes and says, Babylon, it's fallen. It's ultimately powerless against God. And then in verse 9, a third angel comes and he's shouting, anyone who worships the beast and his statue or accepts the mark on his forehead or the hand, must drink the wine of God's anger. It has been poured out full strength into God's cup of wrath, and they will be tormented with fire and burning sulfur in the presence of the holy angels and the Lamb. The smoke of their torment will rise forever and ever. They will have no relief day or night, for they have worshipped the beast and his statue and accepted the mark of his name. This first angel comes on the scene. He says, fear God, give glory to him. The time is coming where he will judge. The second angel, Babylon is fallen. See, here's what we're hearing so far from these two angels. Listen, God is the one who's the creator. He is the one who's in control. He is good, so fear him. I'm not afraid of him, but relational respect, awe, wonder, surrender. Come under him. He is the rightful judge, not the beast. This is part of the good news. God is the creator. He is the one we come under. The second angel comes on the scene, and he says, the enemy and all this prestige and power and might, Babylon is fallen. It's done away with. And this third angel comes and announces, if anyone worships the beast, takes his mark, they've sealed their fate. You see, there will be a time. There's coming a day where there's a line to cross, a point of no return, so to speak, where judgment will Come. Do you see that there in verse 10 that he describes it as drinking the wine of God's anger? Doesn't that remind you of the Garden of Gethsemane where Jesus, Jesus, we're told, willingly accepted the cup of suffering for our forgiveness? Willingly took that for us. But everyone who refuses Jesus chooses the cup of God's righteous anger. It's not God's wrong anger. It's his righteous anger. And some would say, well, you know, the Bible never teaches about a literal hell, about this place of ongoing torment. I don't know. Did you read verse 11? That, that seems pretty clear. Verse 11 says, the smoke of their torment will rise forever. 
You know, one author put it this way. In, in Matthew chapter 25, Jesus declares that hell was created for the devil and his fallen angels, not for people. But if you slap away the hand of God and reject his gift of forgiveness, then you will, of your own choosing, follow the devil and his fallen angels right into hell and the lake of fire. God sends these three angels. Why? To say this, listen, God is good. He's the creator. He's the one that's going to judge, not this beast, not this enemy. Babylon is fallen, and those who follow him will follow him to his end. So what's the call to the people to whom John was writing in that first century? To us in the 21st century, to those that will be living during this time. Look at verse 12. Here's the call. This means that God's holy people must endure persecution patiently patiently, obeying his commands and maintaining their faith in Jesus. And John says, I heard a voice from heaven saying, write this down. Blessed are those who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the spirit, they're blessed indeed for they will rest from their hard work for their good deeds follow them. Stick and stay with Jesus. You know, one of the greatest resources I feel like I could recommend as a Christian, as a pastor, as you read through the Bible, as you even consider passages like this, where you're considering that which is to come. You see in the first five verses or so that there's this sense of surety that God's salvation is coming as those who are walking through the great tribulation are in this time where the beast seems ferociously victorious, God reminds them, no, the salvation is coming. As we read about these angels that God is going to send to declare this good news, this gospel, that God is still God, that the enemy is destroyed, and those that follow the enemy are going to follow him to his ultimate doom. It's very easy to ask, like, how does this apply to my Sunday in October when the weather's awesome. Here's a resource I want to recommend. The Life Application Bible. Anyone heard of this Bible? Very well known. In this section of Revelation 14, I wanted to read something to you, and I'm going to put it on the screen that I think is so applicable for these truths that we're considering. The surety of God's salvation, the surety of God's gospel. This is what it says. This news about God's ultimate triumph should encourage God's people to remain faithful through every trial and persecution. Let me see your eyes real quick. Anyone walking through or ever walked through trial and persecution? Okay, listen to what this says. They can do this. Stick and stay with Jesus. God's promises by trusting in Jesus, by obeying the commands found in his word, the secret to enduring is trust and obedience. Trust God to give you the patience to endure, even the small trials you face daily. Obey him, even when obedience is unattractive or dangerous, which often it is. While it's true, it says that money and fame and belongings can't be taken with us from this life, God's people can produce Fright? I don't think it should say that. The right that survives even to death. God will remember our love, kindness, and faithfulness, and those who accept Christ through our witness will join us in the new earth. Be sure that your values are in line with God's values and decide today to produce fruit that lasts forever. I love this. You see, in Revelation 14, we're given this picture of that which is to come that God's salvation is a sure thing, that the gospel is a sure thing. As we look at these 144,000 witnesses who walk with God, who don't lose sight of the big picture, that God is mighty and that he'll save. And that those who stick and stay with Jesus, as it says in verse 13, they will rest from their hard work. Do you see what John's writing there? For those that follow the enemy, man, they're in torment forever. For those that follow the Lord, there will be rest. 
rest and their good deeds will follow them. See, one of the biggest lies the enemy, I think, brings before believers on a daily basis is that what we do now in relationships with our resources and time, that it kind of only matters here and now. But the Bible speaks of this judgment, if you want to call it that. It's more like a reward ceremony for believers called the Bema Seat Judgment, where God brings rewards for the life of obedience and faith that you lived for him. Obedience doesn't bring you into heaven. Jesus' obedience does that. We don't earn our way into heaven. Jesus did that for us. But you need to recognize that how you handle yourself in life, how you treat people, how you share the gospel and, and prioritize evangelism in your own life, purity, it pays dividends into eternity. What you do, right, Maximus, echoes in eternity, so to speak, right? Like the lifestyle that you live, it has an impact in what happens in eternity. And that's what this life application Bible comment, that's what this section of scripture calls us to today. Stick and stay with Jesus. As you go through hard times, trust and obey him. And find yourselves rooted in community. You know, we are not designed to walk through this life as believers solo, but in unity and in community with one another. And this morning we see from Revelation 14 that the salvation that God has is a sure thing. That the gospel that God is, has for us is a sure thing. And then lastly this morning, here's what we'll see. That the judgment of God is a sure thing. Look at verse 14. We'll read all the way through to the end of the chapter. Verse 14, John says... Then I saw a white cloud. Remember that. A white cloud. And seated on the cloud was someone like the Son of Man. He had a gold crown on his head and a sharp sickle in his hand. Then another angel came from the temple and shouted to the one sitting on the cloud, Swing the sickle, for the time of harvest has come. The crop on earth is ripe. So the one sitting on the cloud swung the sickle over the earth, and the whole earth was harvested. After that, another angel came from the temple in heaven. He also had a sharp sickle, and the other angel who had power to destroy with fire came from the altar. And he shouted to the angel with the sharp sickle, swing your sickle now to gather the clusters of grapes from the vines of the earth, for they are ripe for judgment. So the angel swung his sickle over the earth and loaded the grapes into the great winepress of God's wrath. The grapes were trampled in the winepress outside the city and blood flowed from the winepress in a stream about 180 miles long and as high as a horse's bridle. John sees a white cloud in the midst of all of this. White describing purity, glory, victory. A cloud, picturesque of the presence of God. Someone like the Son of Man, that's Jesus, crowned with a sickle in hand, an instrument of judgment. Uh, by now, I hope you're picking up on the theme of this chapter. In the midst of all that's happening and the beast is ravaging the world, John is sharing the surety that Jesus is enthroned. That it's his judgment, not the judgment of the beast that stands. And there are three angels spoken of here. The first three angels in this chapter were proclaiming. They were heralding the gospel. These three angels here are preparing and harvesting for judgment. And in verse 15, the angel says, swing the sickle. For the time of harvest has come. The, the crop on the earth is ripe. 
It's interesting, as you look at that in the original language, that word ripe means totally ripe, almost to the point where it's becoming rotten and withered. Like it is time for judgment to come. God has mercifully withheld judgment until it's almost like, man, it's like overripe. It's ready. And what we read here is kind of an explanation of what Jesus spoke about in Matthew 13 in that parable of the wheat and the tares. Jesus said in that chapter, at the end of the age, the Son of Man will send forth his angels to the earth to gather the tares and to cast them into the fire of torment and suffering. And Revelation 14 is a, a vivid picture of what Jesus described there in Matthew 13. And one author put it this way, God's wrath and judgment are likened to a great wine press. Symbolically, the angels will gather the grapes of wrath or the unsaved and cast them into God's great wine press of judgment. In the first century, a wine press consisted of two vats, one large and another smaller. And the gathered grapes were cast into the upper vat where they were trampled underfoot. During this process, the juice from those trampled grapes would flow down to the lower. So the word picture that's being used here is to describe the judgment of the Lord in the final days of the tribulation. And instead of juice flowing, the wine press of God's wrath will be filled with the blood of the unsaved. This is intense stuff. Graphically descriptive to those who would have first been reading it. So, oh yeah, we know what a wine press does. He goes, well, that's going to be the blood of those who don't follow the lambs. Like, goodness gracious. The judgment that God's going to bring is a sure thing. A sure thing. There's this specific description of 180 miles as high as a horse's bridle, it says. It's interesting that the approximate distance in the area known as Armageddon in the northern part of Israel to the southern part is about that distance. What is this saying? It's not the beast. God is going to bring righteous judgment. Now let me see if we can, if we can wrap this up and bring a sense of clarity to what this chapter is sharing and showing us this morning. Remember, chapter 14 comes after which chapter? 13. 13. 18 of you are still awake. That's awesome. 14 comes after 13. In 13, we see the beast seemingly winning. He's destroying. He's being worshipped by those who are applauding what he's doing. God's people, they seem ransacked. We, we read from Timothy this morning to, to, to give picturesque to the reality that we're living in a time where good is seemingly being called evil everywhere we go. And evil is being called good. The Bible tells us these are those days, those last days that are coming. We live in a time that's dark, yes, but the time that's coming is going to get even darker. And so what happens in chapter 14 of the book of Revelation, God gives John this vision of what's to come in the midst of all this darkness. And here's the sure thing you can bank on. God's salvation is a sure thing. Those 144,000 are protected. I like that it doesn't say 144, well, 139,999, right? Right? All 144K made it through. God's salvation is a sure thing. It's also showing us that the gospel of God is going to be proclaimed. And the gospel that's being shared here is that God is good. The enemy is not. He's going to fall. And those who follow him will follow him to his eternal end. But those that are with Jesus, like it says in verse 13... They will have rest. The salvation of God is a sure thing. God in his mercy through these angels is still declaring the gospel. But ultimately, the judgment of God is a sure thing that is surely coming. It's not in opposition to his mercy or love. And this can be a tough thing for some people to swallow. That, that God's judgment is coming, that it's described as this wine press. You know, I read this week about a, 
Christian theologian from Croatia who couldn't reconcile that there's a God of love who would also, like we see in chapter 14, bring judgment. And, and as I read an excerpt from this book, I wanted to share it with you because I think it puts in proper perspective everything we're seeing in this series that Jesus is full of mercy and justice. Let me read it to you. He, he says this, my last resistance, meaning I couldn't get there, to the idea of God's wrath was a casualty of war in the former Yugoslavia, the region in which I come. According to some estimates, he writes, 200,000 people were killed and over 3 million displaced. My villages and cities were destroyed. My people shelled day in and day out. Some of them brutalized beyond imagination. And he says, I could not imagine God not being angry at this. He says, or think of Rwanda in the last decade of the past century where 800,000 people were hacked to death in 100 days. How did God react to the carnage? He says, by doting on the perpetrators in a grandfatherly fashion, by refusing to condemn the bloodbath, but instead affirming the perpetrator's basic goodness. He asked this question, wasn't God fiercely angry with them? He said, though I used to complain about the indecency of the idea of God's wrath, I came to think that I would have to rebel against a God who wasn't wrathful at the sight of the world's evil. Amen. God isn't wrathful in spite of being love. God is wrathful because God is love. And this is the picture I hope you're getting in Revelation 14. This was an intense sermon to write. Did you know there wasn't one joke or funny bunny story or like anything throughout this whole chapter? Like as I was like writing, I was like, man, we've got to have some kind of reprieve, right? This is the reprieve that needs to be spoken about here. You need to kind of hang in this for a moment. As the people in this time are walking through intense persecution, the enemy seems to be winning left and right everywhere. John is given this vision of the lamb on Mount Zion with the 144,000. These individuals that walked with him, they're worshiping him. There's a sense of intimacy there because they have relationship with him. He, he's shown these angels that go and proclaim the gospel. And here, if I could summarize it, if I could put it in the NIV, Neil's interesting version, here's what they're saying. God is good. He's the creator. The enemy who seems right now to be winning the peak and pinnacle of his might, Babylon, it's fallen. Turn to him because all that don't are going to follow the enemy into his eternal state. That's what these angels are saying. And then lastly, John sees this vision of the Son of Man on the cloud. It's white, there's purity, there's victory, there's the presence of God. And there's this judgment that's coming. It's a sure thing. And I love how this author writes. He says, God isn't wrathful in spite of being love. God is wrathful because of his love. Sin needs to be judged. And on the cross of Jesus Christ, that is where he poured out his wrath for you and for me. All you have to do is freshly surrender to him. And God's wrath is satisfied on your behalf. But God would not be God if he did not judge sin. Can we agree on that? Amen. So God in his mercy sent his son Jesus. And even for those who reject this in the time that is to come, don't you see his mercy? He's got these 144,000. He's got angels flying around preaching the gospel. But there will finally come a time where it says in the language here of Revelation 14 that it's like, listen, the time is like almost overripe. God, you've been as patient and as merciful as you can be. Judgment has to come. And it will. It will. 
But as we see throughout this chapter, as we see throughout this book, as we see throughout this time known as the Great Tribulation, God in his mercy continually reach out, reaches out to people. And God is doing that today to you and to me. Through the work of his spirit, through the person of his son, you need to know that God is pursuing you. Wherever you are, whatever you're going through, listen to the message of what's being said here. God is good. The enemy, he's going to be defeated. There will be this day of rest that's coming. Follow him. Worship him. Live lives of purity like we see of these 144,000. There's a sense of intimacy with God, and that's what your heart really longs for that comes in just walking with God. You see, it's not justice that brings a person to heaven. It's God's mercy. Justice is God's judgment. That's what should happen. But aren't you thankful that God is truly of God, of mercy and justice? That's what we see in this chapter. He's giving this sense of clarity to these individuals who are walking through this time of persecution, saying, no, 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 my salvation, my gospel, my judgment are a sure thing. Stick and stay with me. Have your heart be freshly surrendered to me. Walk with me through difficult days and good days for my salvation, my gospel, my judgment are a sure thing.